Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to New Books and Popular Culture, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm your host, Dr. Elizabeth Woke, and today we'll be talking to Dr. Harriet Earle about her book, Comics, Trauma, and the New Art of War, published in 2007 with the University of Mississippi Press. Dr. Harriet Earle is a senior lecturer in English at Sheffield University and a research fellow at the Center for War, Atrocity, and Genocide at the University of Nipissing. She is the author of This and Comics and Introduction. Dr. Earle's book looks at comics which are explicitly about historical war conflicts and is among the first full-length studies of conflict and trauma in comics, using theoretical frameworks from trauma studies, comic studies, and literary theory to analyze the ways in which American comics create trauma narratives. The study works with autobiographical texts, life writing or memoir, mainstream series, and fictional one-shots because each one adds something to the conversation of how comics can represent conflict and specifically conflict trauma, and why these representations are important in the wider scheme of conflict narrative and representational strategy. This draws from comic studies and a pluralistic model of trauma theory. Comics, Trauma, and the New Art of War looks at formal aspects of creating comics which depict trauma and starts with three texts, the Iliad, Beowulf, and the Mort d'Arthur. Turning to contemporary comics, it looks at the depiction of traumatic dreams in comics like The Nom, Mouse, American Widow, and others, and then dedicates a chapter to comics using the framing of retelling family stories. Dr. Earle considers questions of form and genre, and the final section of the book considers the representation of female characters and the issue of women in the comics industry. This book argues that, quote, the representation of a traumatic event in any artistic medium relies on the artist's ability to recreate the experience of the event, not necessarily the event itself. That is the trauma the individual experienced and continues to experience. The specific structural and artistic techniques of the comic are able to mimic the symptoms of a traumatic rupture in the formal presentation of the narrative, which in turn is able to mimic the experience of a traumatic rupture in the reader. In this interview, Dr. Earl talks about the challenges of analyzing war comics, the silencing of certain characters in war stories, and the graphic proclivities of conflict narratives. I am here with Dr. Harriet Earle. Uh, could you please start us off by telling us a little bit about your academic journey that brought you to the projects you're working on now? Um, yeah, so I had a rather unusual journey in that I took a completely different turn when it came to doing my master's. Um, so I, I did a literature degree and then I decided to do two masters in theology um, for reasons that I'm actually not entirely sure and then went back into comics. So um, I had a bit, a bit of a break where I could really think about what it was that I loved and wanted to do. So I, um, the the academic journey started proper, shall we say, um, at Keele University in the UK. I took my my PhD in American Lit, focusing on conflict, comics, trauma, violence, everything post 1975, um, and the um the, the book comics trauma and the new art of war is my phd thesis that's been um turned into a monograph uh, and since then i've been working in english departments um at the moment i'm teaching creative writing and um thinking about trauma while teaching creative writing does lead to some interesting conversations um so my 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 teaching life and my research life are quite disconnected but i'm i'm sort of trying to find ways to put them together and pull them closer uh, mostly by using a lot of comics in the classroom. Um, yeah, so that's where I currently am. Thank you. What was the first comic that turned you in this direction that you were reading critically? Oh, yikes. I mean, I've been reading comics since I could read. Um, and I had all the Tintins and all the Asterix and all the, you know, every, every kid's comic going. Um, I think the first one that I read and looked at I thought, okay, there's something there's something here that is that that needs more was um Tintin and the Blue Lotus uh which I now for some reason have in like 10 different languages <laughs> it's my collection um but that whole idea of where he's talking about um sort of sinophobia and 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 
the, the image of China and the image of the West and and all of that sort of um, almost it's almost sort of Orientalism in comics. Um, and I know that this is something that's been really talked about a lot by other scholars, but that was the first one reading that thinking, OK, so we could maybe use this to talk about these issues. Um, although I've never I've never written on Tintin. So I thought had those thoughts and then immediately stepped away. <laughs> so um, but I think that that was the first one. And it's great. I mean, it it's it's dodgy and it has really weird messages in it. But actually, it, it as a teaching tool for thinking about the way that comics do race, it, it's a good starting point, I think. Definitely. And uh, yeah, there has been a lot of work on Tintin and hopefully that will continue. Mm. Oh, yeah. All right. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Oh, it'd be great if we can turn now to the book. Um, I had a couple of concrete things I wanted to talk with you about, uh, but feel free to go off on any other tangents as they come up. Um, I really liked how you opened up your book by kind of anchoring your discussion around Picasso's Guernica as an example of this. Um, I labeled it an affective uh, recreation. You have it written there as yeah. a recreation of a traumatic yeah. event. And then turn to comics as, and you quote Hilary Shute here from Drawing Disaster, innovative and a forward thinking medium uh, to engage the difficulty of spectacle instead of turning away from it. Um, could you please elaborate on how comics do this and how you connect this to Guernica? Yeah, so when I was when I was writing, I mean, it was the, the thesis at that point, I'd been looking at um, where do we where do we see conflict represented in in narrative texts, mostly in literary texts, but with more of a focus on um, the sort of war is hell, war is traumatic narrative. And I mean, it, it it goes all the way back to the Iliad. So it's something that is sort of long standing. It's not a modern creation. And when I was doing all that, I came across an article in, I think it was the London Review of Books. And it was uh, Malcolm Bull. He was reviewing some book about Guernica. And it mentioned The Dream and Lie of Franco, which is this series of, of images that Picasso drew before he created Guernica. And he was going to sell them as postcards to raise money for um, the cause in Spain. The Spanish Civil War was going on at the time. He was living in France. And they are very much like a comic because the, the sheet that we have, the sort of the, the sketch sheet, is all these, these images of, of Franco, who looks a bit like a sweet potato, um, doing really weird... Like There's one of him with a gigantic penis. There's one of him dressed as a courtesan. There's one where he's riding a pig. So these really bizarre images, but then there's, so there's two sheets of these. And on the second sheet, he started working on the um, the sketches of what would become Guernica. And so I was looking at these thinking, oh, this is an interesting sort of disconnected comic. And then when you look at the painting of Guernica, it, it does very much read like a comics tableau. And there is paneling um, because at one point, like one corner, it sort of looks like it's within a house but then the rest of it looks like it's outside. So this really weird panelling, um, plus the cubist elements, which make it even more sort of panelled. The, the actual faces and, and the characters um, have this sort of panel feeling, but it, it's also telling a narrative and the and characters are reacting to one another within the painting. And so I thought Picasso, we'd consider him, high, I mean, I'd consider him high art if you want to make that distinction. I don't like that distinction, but you know what I mean. And comics, low art, trash, whatever you want to say. I wouldn't say any of those, of course. But actually, you can create that. You can see how Picasso, this sort of great, internationally wonderful artist, is using the same kinds of techniques as comics to represent this unspeakable tragedy. And the it kind of came from there, thinking about we can't, necessarily see comics as low art just because they are for kids for whoever they've got fart jokes in them you know and so if we if we take Guernica as the the, the jumping off point saying this is this highly affective way of looking at conflict and violence and it's doing a lot of the same stuff that comics is doing it's it's in your face it's using panels it's asking the reader to make connections between the images 
Um, as Scott McLeod likes the term closure, I know it's it's sort of it's not fashionable at the moment, but that idea of actually the the reader has so much to do within the narrative to create it themselves. Comics is doing all of this, and because some of the the works that I was looking at in my in my own corpus are Second World War, although they're all written after seventy five, but they're they're talking about a similar period in history. As Guernica was created, what, 37, 1937? It it made sense to start there to me. And it also felt like it was an interesting way of doing comic studies. And it's a bit overblown to call myself interesting, but everything I'd read at that point was sort of going in strong with, you know, comics, Superman, superheroes, 1930s is the start, which I I don't agree with. And I don't know many scholars who do but as an Americanist this certainly seemed to be where everyone was starting and so I wanted to say something quite different but what I also thought that it gave me for the starting point of the book is to say representations of, of conflict have not changed massively we've had these these sort of tab these war tableau for hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of years and they're doing very similar things. And then Guernica just adds that that nice, comfortable stepping stone between the art and the comic in that it's using panels. It's using a lot of the same kind of grammar that we would expect from a comic. Um, so that was why I wanted to use Guernica. And my supervisors were horrified, um, but, you know, I stuck it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, um, Ellie. Uh, no, you nicely bookend this by coming back to it in the conclusion to talk about X-Men Guernica. Um, yes, yeah, yes. which, which I found completely by, well, I found this piece completely by chance. Um, and it's created by uh, an artist who put it on DeviantArt, so an, an online art sharing website. And she uses, I'm sorry, I'm assuming there, they use um, the figures of the X-Men in exactly the same shape as Guernica, but the idea is the destruction of, of the school. And um, I thought the fact that she had they had taken this particularly famous painting and, and then said, you know, oh, we'll just put the X-Men in it, it really changes the narrative. But also the way that they selected the characters for each role within the painting, I thought was really interesting. Um, and like the the in the in Guernica, there's the slain soldier who's lying at the foot of the painting, and his hands are outstretched. And there's a sort of a suggestion of stigmata, uh, and that became Cyclops. It's like oh, the blinded soldier. Oh, there's so many, so much image there. Um, so it worked really nice for the for the book ending, but also shows that comics are engaging with um, with this art quite quite literally. <laughs> they are taking it and and sort of remediating it through through comics and. Um, there was an exhibition at the Picasso Museum. Of course, it was during COVID, so I couldn't go. That looked at actually how Picasso uses comics in his work and how there's that connection between the two. Um, and sort of thinking more broadly about how what Guernica does as a painting, which is it shocks, it disrupts, it upsets. Um, and I, I went to see it, and I think I looked for it for an hour. An hour and cried and the the docent was getting quite concerned about me but it's an incredible piece of art comics is doing similar things on the page but it's doing it on a on a physically smaller scale because of course Guernica is enormous and in different ways so we have things like page turns and it's mobilizing the response of the individual and the body of the individual to do the same kind of affective reading of conflict yeah, and you uh, make the comment there that um, while this X-Men Guernica can be, I don't know, kind of dismissed as mere parody, you're you're pointing out that it's pastiche and you use the quote, pastiche is the cannibalism of the past and represents a loss of connection to a historical referent that it becomes simulacra. Do you see mm. that um, same usage in the other comics that you're looking at in the corpus in your book? That they've sort of cannibalized and it's become a historical pastiche. Sometimes I've certainly noticed it much more in my current project. Um, I think because I've been looking for it more. Um, so at the at the moment, I'm I'm writing about uh, the Vietnam War and the way that the Vietnam War is remediated in comics, and um, 
the use of photographs especially so um for example there's this this um, issue of the nam which is a long running or it was one of the longest running vietnam series it's finished now marvel series and they they use the photograph of um the burning monk who um very famous image by malcolm brown's self-immolation of um of monk in in saigon in 1963 to talk about a completely different thing within the war the, the my Lai massacre and in putting together those two events in in this comic it removes any of the historical context of both and it completely downplays what both are doing so that sort of cannibalizing pastiche is very much visible there and and it's all the way through comics of, of vietnam certainly um because the photographs are so well known but the conflict itself is not it's not necessarily understood in the way that I think it should be. A <laughs> um, little bit of a judgmental statement there, but I think the way that a lot of people remember Vietnam is actually not, not what happened. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do in this book is point out all of these moments where we have an image that has been ripped out of its context completely and becomes something else. And in becoming something else really becomes nothing. Yeah. Thank you for uh, summarizing that. When you're talking about how some of these ideas have even carried on to projects you're working on now, um, I wanted to ask you, this is a big topic and you have a, a very large and complex corpus that you're drawing from in there. It must have been a lot of work. Um, how has your thinking on the topic developed since you wrote this? Uh, where did you start and which concepts have you held on to and which have you either modified or discarded since then? So I should give credit to the person who gave me the idea for this. Um, Roger Sabin and I met him while well, we'd, we'd worked together and, and known him and I we bumped into him at a conference and I said oh I've got this this idea for a project but it's really crap and he went oh oh well, right that's a weird way to start a pitch and <laughs> it was like it, and I gave him this idea that was nothing to do with Vietnam at all and he said oh that really surprises me I would have thought that you'd have picked up some of the trauma stuff maybe written about Vietnam. And I'm like, no, why would I do that? And then of course the, the seed was planted. And um, one of my research colleagues um, at the University of Nipissing was like, hey, we should do some stuff with Vietnam. I thought, okay, I'm not gonna escape it, am I? Um, so that's where the the idea for that one came from. But when I was when I was writing the first book, there was just too much, that it was too big, and I should not have been writing something that was so big because what I left out was was huge. Um, and I, at the time, I think I had that typical PhD student, eyes bigger than stomach. You know, I can write about all of this. I can set right the entire world of war comics. No. <laughs> um, and so now I'm looking at things and thinking, oh, I should have written about that. That would have been great. And it, they just got cut. So... I think there were a lot of ideas that were going around in my my mind palace that have sort of taken up residence there and now have to come out in other ways. Um, one of the things I, I did in the first book was argued with Freud. And um, I, I, am I allowed to say that I hate Freud? Is that okay? Oh, yeah, we're not I going hate... to censor preferences <laughs> here. So I'm not going to uh, dig him up and tell him. No, I, it's okay. <laughs> I really, I really hate Freud, and a lot of what he was doing in his trauma work was groundbreaking. It was good. He had the basics. It could have been fantastic, and then he ignored women. And he ignored the truth of the situation. He ignored the fact that most of his early research um, participants, shall we call them, uh, were victims of, of awful abuse. And he decided that that wasn't going to work for his funding stream, I assume. And so in the book, I did this sort of thing where I was arguing with Freud and saying, no, this is completely wrong. But actually, he, he did have some good ideas. And I think now that I've been sitting with my discomfort with him for so long I'm now at the point where I can say oh Freud yeah okay whatever 
he started it. But really, we need to be talking about you know, these guys who've got it right. And this is what trauma theory is doing. And and so I think the, the biggest thing that I've moved on from since writing um, the, the Firstborn, as it's become known, is I don't need to argue everything quite so much. I think saying, yeah, Freud had some good ideas. Actually, most of them were crap. And let's move on to what grew from his good ideas because that's more interesting um and i think that's given me a tremendous freedom when it comes to the like the theoretical underpinnings of all of this um i think we do get a bit bogged down in trying to justify ourselves sometimes especially with someone like freud who is like the grandfather of all of this sort of thinking like yeah you but you can also be wrong but it's fine and we can leave him in in the past that's that's also okay <laughs> um so I think that that thinking has very much developed. And a, another thing that I, I struggled with when I was making the book into a book, my reviewer made the point that where are the women? Like you haven't written about women. And when I was writing that section, all of the hoo-ha was going on at the Angoulême festival that they hadn't had a female Grand Prix. And there'd been one. And and they were it was all very yeah, it all became a bit of a an issue. So I, I wrote an extra section that I called the excursus, where I think actually, where are the women and where are the women in these comics? And now that has become a major focus for me. So in, in the new book, in the Vietnam book, I've got a whole section thinking about where are women in these stories? The Vietnam War had hundreds of thousands of female participants, combatants, supporters, and where are they? And so that's become quite a major focus um, and is informed by um, feminist theory, feminist media theory, um, and my own um, sort of belief that we shouldn't be ignoring voices, which I don't think is controversial. I don't I hope it's controversial. Um, and, and that actually looking at where the silencing happens, even if it's not an intentional silencing, more of an ignorant silencing. Um, that really changes the way that we're looking at these narratives, both in comics and as historiography. Yeah, if I can uh, jump on that for a mm. moment, I, I've had the pleasure of seeing you present at conferences. And when you're speaking about silencing, um, you also go into the visual plane and highlight the staging of silence in the composition mm. of the image. Would you be willing to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, I think so. This is this has become the the primary focus of this Vietnam book: the idea that certain groups are being silenced and it affects the war narrative. And there's a um, oh, I can't think who the scholar is. I think it's E. Anne Kaplan who wrote a book about motherhood in film, and she does this great analysis of a birth scene where you don't see the mother. You see the the um, the genitals and the baby coming out, but you don't see the mother, and you see the father. So that idea of like ripping women out of their own story. Um, and you so, see the uh, sorry, the book is Motherhood and Representation: The Mother in Popular Culture. Is that crew, uh, correct by E. N. Kaplan? Yes, yeah, right, that'll be thank it. You. Mm -hmm. um, but that idea that for certain ways of viewing the narrative and in this case it's become the dominant narrative we just don't need the women and they complicate matters and certainly looking at at the silencing it becomes this sort of disembodied quite literally so you'll get the feet and maybe a hand but no speech and um i, I don't think any woman really gets a voice in Vietnam comics with the exception of one or two that makes it even more obvious that they're only like one or two um but that that idea that they're being silenced because they don't fit the narrative that is being put forward so change the narrative but of course then you get into the the complex issues of actually what what did happen and is the narrative that's been put forward by the military and by the media how, how is that different and also why did they feel the need to do that and those are questions i don't think a lot of people are really prepared to ask um but this idea of and it, i mean it's not just women also um sort of within the Viet, whole vietnam context the the vietnamese themselves are either wizened little 
simian creatures. I know that sounds incredibly racist, but that is how they're portrayed on the page. It's sort of awful racist depiction. Yeah, or... you're speaking about how, how they're illustrated, how yeah, the artist yeah. chose to illustrate them in the comics, yeah. And then there's a there's a cover um of this American guy and he's taking on like three Vietnamese men all at once and they just look like they are very sort of monkey like um and also bright yellow like worryingly yellow. <laughs> and we know that comics printing could have done better it's not a printing issue um so they're either sort of that and they then they have no voice or they are literally not there they are the gunfire coming out of a jungle thicket followed by followed by nothing there is no voice for these characters they don't have names um they don't have backstories they are not fully fleshed out and therefore allowed to speak they're just um props in the americans sort of playing war and it it leads to this this overarching story of big brave americans go into vietnam shoot at the forest and leave which is not the truth. <laughs> I don't think I need to to say that, but it's it's not in any way accurate. Um, but so the, this idea of of silence, and I mean, there's some great stuff from Foucault who talks about like there are many silences, and I want to draw the um, sort of the, make clear the difference between being silent and being silenced, and that one can choose to be silent which in itself could be an act of defiance an act of strength but being silenced and being denied a voice or being forcibly um forcibly shut up so um there's a lot of please excuse the next statement there's a lot of throat slashing so the literal silencing the destruction of the voice um rather than just they're silent within the comic because they aren't allowed to speak they are literally being unable being made unable to speak um and so the, the ways that that affects this sort of overarching idea of of conflict is something that i find visually really fascinating but also in in a narratological sense like what is it doing for what we think of when we think of these certain conflicts yeah thank you um so as you moved away from freud uh which were the scholars or the concepts or the methods that you've been employing since then um ooh. Ooh. there's there isn't sort of one person who i've leapt on the back of but i've become so the, the term that I, I like to use is the, the pluralistic model of trauma theory and looking at people like, so Michelle Balayev is one, um, she's a literary theorist, a literary scholar who talks quite a lot about actually trauma is is deeply individual. And we can look at the bank of symptoms, um, but really it's much more than that. And there is this, this drive within the individual to speak. So all of the stuff that Freud and his, his ideological offspring um, like to say, people like Kathy Carruth, about the you know the unspeakable and the silence in the middle of trauma. Ballet ever saying, no, people want to speak. That's why they have flashbacks, nightmares, um, traumatic numbing. It's all that need to get it out. And so this is what trauma literature is doing. It's giving this outlet to then say, this is what happened to me. And you know, with huge corpuses of of trauma memoir and um Lots of conflict memoir, but also other types of trauma. Um, it was maybe about 15 years ago, there was that rush of child abuse memoirs that was all quite dominating, in the, certainly in the UK literary marketplace. Um, but that need to speak is not, um, it, it is difficult and it is painful, but it is a need to speak. It isn't a, it isn't a, an, an unspeakability. So I, I'm, in going with those kinds of um, models of looking at trauma, and it has become more common in clinical trauma. So I've been using the DSM-5 um, to think about what are the symptoms and how are they made visible on the comics page? Um, but also psychiatrists like Bessel van der Kolk, who uh, wrote a really fantastic book called The Body Keeps the Score, which is about actually this, like, this, the, the psychological, physiological um, relationship between uh, it, for traumatic bodies um and and anything that allows me to think about trauma 
in a non-medical sense. So quite often we think about PTSD and people talk about PTSD and PTS and that's fine, but we can't diagnose fictional characters and we shouldn't diagnose fictional characters. So is it better to talk about trauma as a sort of cultural response to atrocity rather than this person witnessed this awful thing and now has PTSD, which isn't necessarily as fruitful um, especially when talking about people who actually may not have witnessed directly. Uh, so there's a whole conversation around events like 9-11. Um, Can you be traumatized by watching the news coverage? And classic trauma theory would say no, because your life is up and put in jeopardy. You haven't had that, that moment of, oh my God, I'm going to die, which is sort of the root, the root of the traumatic neurosis is the word that Freud uses. Um, but actually, is there a more sort of broad cultural trauma around 9-11? Yes, absolutely. And and that comes through. I mean, there's lots of 9-11 comics that talk about that. And there are people who talk about their, their stay in certain combat zones where they weren't, their life wasn't threatened. And yet they are struggling to come to terms with their experiences. Um, so I think looking at, at trauma in that way and keeping Freud in the background because he was one of the first to actually say oh look the, these are the sorts of symptoms and for the most part he was correct in the sort of basic symptoms um plus he has some great words love those compound german words um but it's it's only a basic understanding of what's going on and and using him as anything more than a very basic understanding is it doesn't do justice to actually the complexities and and the individual i think yeah and uh what you keep coming back to or i hear you coming back to uh as we're speaking now and as i've heard you speak uh before um going through the materials you're going through and also doing the reading that you're you're doing in order to build up your conceptual framework for this type of analysis. Um, what are the biggest challenges to working with this type of corpus? Do you need to take holidays? <laughs> um, I know in the more challenging <laughs> projects I've had, I, I have literally abandoned them because I, I couldn't deal with returning to the primary sources. It's a uh, very difficult work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think I was very fortunate during the writing of the first book when it was still a thesis. My supervisors were, they're amazing, amazing scholars, but also really lovely people. Um, James Peacock and Tim Lustig. And they were very keen to say, okay, yep, step away from that. We'll, we'll just put that to one side, have a few days, go and watch some trash TV. And, and they were aware of the, like the toll that this kind of reading can can have on on a person and um now i've become very fond of disney plus because you can get those sort of cute kids cartoons where everything is lovely and just as a sort of a brain rinse because some of the images are i would be concerned if they didn't affect me i think if i started looking at them and and was just like yeah that would be a sign that I needed to move on to another project because they are they are meant to be deeply, deeply upsetting. And I think that is a normal, healthy reaction and is not to be... I shouldn't be looking for ways to get rid of that reaction. I think it's good to to think that way about these things. And you mentioned that these are, are deeply upsetting images. I absolutely agree. Yes. <laughs> um, but we're talking about deeply upsetting images that are part of popular media. And I don't want to play into the misconception that comics have a primary, primarily underage readership because uh, they do a lot of the comics you are using in your mm. corpus are more for an adult readership, would you say? Yes, yeah, yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, so even with the adult readership, these incredibly disturbing images, um, where do you see the current conversations about war and these disturbing images and comics it, as comics as popular media, popularly consumed images? And how would you like to see the conversation evolve? War, so war comics are a, are a tricky one. And I think we've reached the point within 
the like the non-academic side of comics, the sort of the marketplace, that people are starting to tell their parents' stories and their grandparents' stories. So um and it, it's not a book that I like or want to read ever again, but mouse. Um and because this is not a visual podcast, I'm pulling a face. <laughs> but that idea of we're we're now at the position where there are enough comic artists who actually think, okay, I've got this story in my in my childhood, in my in my parents' childhood or my parents' life that I need to get out there. And so rather than the um the gung-ho handsome man going off to war and coming home and marrying his sweetheart kind of narrative which was very much what we saw in the 50s and 60s when war comics were much more popular sort of serialized war comics by marvel dc those kind of publishers charlton was a big one that's not the most common type of war comic at the moment it's now this sort of much more um more broad like family narrative so something like gb trans vietnam america where he talks about his family who were in Vietnam during during the conflict, talking about their experience as non-combatants, as civilians. I think his parents are both teachers. And so the war becomes a part of a wider family narrative, and that's that's becoming much more common. But it also means that a lot of the images of the conflict itself are are bound up in quite a, quite a deeply woven context. Um, so, for example, there's a bit in The Best We Could Do by G- uh, by T. Bui, which is a really wonderful um, family narrative about the war. And she's talking to her father about the photograph Saigon Execution, um, which is, you'd know it if you saw it, very, very famous. And it's of a man being shot in the head in the street. Um, and the photo itself is, is highly controversial. But she's talking about it and what she thinks is going on and what he thinks is going on in the photograph. And he's talking about it from the point of view of I was there. I knew the kinds of things that were happening. I knew this person's crime and why he was being shot. He was a prisoner being shot by a policeman. And and she's looking at it from a, a sort of a second generation perspective. But throughout the discussion, she redraws the photograph several times in different ways to to talk about actually how is that image made and so while a lot of these images within the comics are incredibly disturbing the con the context has to be there as well otherwise it's just here is a, a pile of deceased bodies for example not here is an image that shows what the u.s army was doing what the, the government was okay with and so war comics is doing something quite different with all of those images now that we've developed the how do I word this nicely the comics literacy to be more nuanced in our depictions was that was that nicely worded? <laughs> not that I want to you know be mean to those who were who were writing and drawing in the in the 50s and 60s and 70s but there is more nuance there that said we also have um series like um Marvel have done some uh war the punisher goes back to his days in the army and those are oof <laughs> they they are definitely not for children they're actually um marked as 18 plus on the cover so they're marvel m marvel mature marvel max i think it is um and the the way that they're dealing with the conflict is is taking that previous narrative of camaraderie masculinity violent masculinity um and turning it up to 11 and saying, oh, yes, let's have a, a graphic sexual assault scene ending with, in the murder of, of the victim, which adds nothing to the war narrative. It's it's for shock value. And I'm not saying that it didn't happen because actually that, that was a common occurrence in that particular conflict and indeed in many conflicts. Mm-hmm. But within the comic, it's used as this sort of, oh, no, look at this bad apple. And... And he's done nasty things, which is, it, I mean, it's a it's a trash narrative. Like we don't need it. It doesn't add anything. And so we've got this kind of, from war comics being something like Commando, which I think is actually still published in the UK. Like, here's a war story and everyone goes home at the end. We've either got this overarching, massive sort of um, autographics 
deep and nuanced and and beautifully drawn actually in many cases or we've got let's set this story of abject horror against the backdrop of the war for no reason as far as i can tell i'm not a fan of the punisher is that obvious yeah um yeah yeah um marianne hirsch has this uh framing our framework of post-memory perspective yeah. yeah which is that third generation intellectual but not biographically mm. affiliation or affiliated to a topic um does that create a sort of visual language of depicting war that we get fossilized into this uh post-memory perspective instead of having uh a more direct treatment of war and war comics? I think so I've actually got a, a paper coming out about this, um, hopefully soon, fingers crossed. But the I think what happens is a, a, almost a mono meaning. So the image becomes um, the image of a conflict and it's a shocking image. I mean, for example, um, very famous photograph, called the terror of war but it's it's more commonly known by its nickname which is napalm girl um small child running naked through uh down a street and there's people all around her and she's been burned very very badly by napalm um she did survive actually you know she, i think she's a psychologist now but that photograph has become this sort of image of oh no here's a terrible thing that happened to this child and this child becomes emblematic of every child in Vietnam and, and it, it just strips out everything that was actually going on in the creation of that photograph. And you know, her brothers are there and they've just lost their family and, and actually what she went through was was hell. But it just it becomes a singular image with a mono meaning. The terror of war. War is hell. War is bad. And not this is literally an innocent child. So I think one of the things that that comics using these photographs in this way it creates a visual literacy where we look at the image and we know that it's a vietnam image and there are many many pictures and you think oh yeah that's a vietnam image the same as we know the photographs of the d-day landings partly because they were immortalized in um saving private ryan the opening opening sequence which is brilliant opening sequence but we recognize the image but we don't know where it sits in the continuity of the war. We don't know what it means for the war. We just have this image of bad thing that happened. And it it really reduces. And I mean, comics are about condensation and reduction anyway, because we've only got little panels to work with, big panels. But they are also able to, to, because there's more than one, and because they have that ability to tell a story across these images, they don't rip the nuance out they can build on it, like is happening in The Best We Could Do with Saigon Execution. But the the image itself, when left sort of free-floating in, in the media, pop culture, and they pop up on those lists of you know, 50 most famous photographs, and there's no, there's no context to what the photograph is. We just look at it and think, oh my God, that's horrible, and move on. And and that is is problematic for war comics that perpetuate that. Very good examples there. I see what you're talking about. Thank you. Um, uh, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the next thing that uh, I think that leads smoothly into is you're working with graphic content in both senses of the word. It is literally illustrated, but graphic as uh, and for mature audiences. And I've seen you when you're speaking about this at conferences, you use your facial expressions, your body language, your stage presence to discuss this very difficult material, which of course you're also showing images to a, a perhaps unwitting audience um treating it with respect and honesty which is very important and in these moments you really shift uh, your mode to address the audience on a human level very directly and you're departing from your formal presenter's tone so i wanted to ask you how do you translate this uh grace and treatment of the material when you're communicating it in the written format which which doesn't necessarily allow for those pauses and decides mm. Yeah, it's a. I think I'm quite animated, <laughs> um, which I don't necessarily think is a bad thing. 
But I, I do think that one thing that we as scholars and people who write primarily academic books need to remember is that academics are also people. And I one thing that I've noticed quite often is whenever I, I mention things like positionality, certainly my colleagues in history go, what? And they get quite uncomfortable by being asked where they sit in relation to the material that they're working with. And that being aware of my own like identity as a young white woman or whatever other identity characteristic might be relevant at the time i th i think it's really important that we not foreground our work by talking about where we sit in relation to it, but that we keep that in mind at all times so for example when i'm writing about um sexual violence I know that I'm writing about that as a woman and I can't say that I can't not. So making, keeping that in the back of my mind, I think changes the way that I write about the material, not to say that it's not, well, I don't think academic scholarship is ever objective, but not to say that I'm being completely bananas and writing my own personal diatribe about rape in comics. Um, I do that elsewhere. But I think if you need to remember that, we're reading this as people who have very specific backgrounds. And so one thing that I do like to do is um, not fall into the trap of academies. I don't think that helps anybody and it's dull. And certainly like, comics doesn't have the, the benefits that something like computer science has of a lingua franca where we are all talking in English. I mean, most of the conferences I've been to have been English speaking, but actually there's a lot of scholarship in other languages and academic writing is really, really hard to translate. So I think actually keeping my writing nice and level and nice and straightforward helps translators. So bigger audience, but also it helps people to realize that this is not necessarily an academic topic in as much as we're writing about events that happened if not in this exact narrative way, but two people, there were people who experienced this particular event in Vietnam. And if we forget that we're writing about things that have happened, then it just becomes sort of navel gazing and it doesn't really have any value beyond the page. So I think keeping, keeping it not conversational and not journalistic, but written in a way that it, it remembers that I'm I'm a human being writing to other human beings about things that may have happened to other human beings, keeps all that in mind. Um, and I'm not particularly keen on, I mean, I hate the word trigger warning. I like content note. And so I think being quite bold about things like subheadings. I have a subheading in the new book, which is war rape and if you want to skip that part please do but actually being quite clear and, and not you know fluffing it up we're writing about something horrific please feel free to part to pass on this section and i'm and i'm writing about this as a woman who grew up in europe who has never seen combat but has different experiences that are going to affect the way that i write about these things and i think not putting that into the work would be disingenuous almost because obviously this is going to affect my analysis and my analysis of for example the punisher is going to be quite different to maybe a grizzled 70 year old vet who went to vietnam on uh, in the army and experienced things he may have a very different reading but we're never going to know unless we actually talk about where we're coming from in the first place so i think <clears throat> it's important to be aware of who we are and 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 be aware that who we are very much affects the way that we're reading these documents and that none of this is objective it's it's all bound up in our own experiences and what other theory we've read and what other comics we've read and um if we know people who've been in those situations we're going to read them differently and i think actually letting that come through in the writing is um is important and and with the visual material in a book, unless you're directly relating to the image, I'm not going to put it in. I don't need to see a picture of a pile of corpses just for funsies. I, I, I want to see an image if you're going to talk about it, and I need to see how it's 
actually shown. But yeah, I don't I don't want fun illustrations of the dead, which I have seen in other books and oh no, <laughs> unnecessary and disrespectful, actually. If they're photographs, especially disrespectful. Um yeah. Yeah, use of images in, in publications for comic studies scholarship is uh, a whole could merit a whole methodological mm. investigation itself. So you gave us a little foreshadowing of some projects you're working on now. Uh, could you give us a little bit more detail about what you're working on now, what you're excited about now? So, oh, yes, so the Vietnam book, which is called, oh no, what is it called? I think it's called Comics in the Vietnam War, Silence, Violence and Trauma, I think. I can't remember what we decided on. Uh, is going to be published with the University of Nebraska Press. Um, the series is called Encapsulations. So they're sh slightly shorter guides to comics, but that, that are doing something to add to the overall scholarship. That's a, I hope I've explained that well. Um, so edited by Martin Lund and Julia Round. And that is, at the moment, I'm, I'm just about to start on the on the introduction and like, I've got this really tight word, word count. I'm like, oh, there's so much I want to say. So that's going to be fun. Um, but hopefully that will be out in, in physical form before the 50th anniversary of the end of the war, which is April 30th, uh, 2025. Um, and there are some other papers that are coming out that are sort of offcuts of Vietnam stuff that didn't make the book. So something on photography and something on um, the My Lai Massacre, um, which is the paper that you heard in, in Munich. Um, so those are both coming out, hopefully, by the end of this year. Uh, I also have a book completely unrelated to that on Bojack Horseman, the Netflix series. Um, it's an edited collection on... Bojack, um, which is go coming out on, I believe, on Halloween um, with McFarlane. And that was sort of a fun side project. I really love Bojack Horseman and thought, oh, I should do something about this. So um, there's a lot of, uh, actually, most of the contributors to that are PhD students, which was especially nice to sort of give a forum for for these this new research um, in a in a book form. So that's coming out soon as well. Um, and on top of all that, I'm, I'm anything like sort of conflict stuff, whenever something new pops up, I think, oh, no, I need to write about this. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, to not pick up too many new projects until the current ones are done. But whoever manages that, if they do, they're lying, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, I never believe it. <laughs> Someone claims to have a tight grip on their publishing pipeline, but yes. um, sounds great. We have a lot of work to look forward to then. Yes, yeah, and and um, it will all. It's. I'm saying now it's on track, and in saying that, I feel I need to keep to that promise. All right. Well, you've made a public commitment. So, um, <laughs> no. so uh, <clears throat> we have heard so much uh, interesting points about your work and uh, also your wider concepts about the depiction of war and comics, especially in the Vietnam War. So, uh, Dr. Earl, thank you so much for joining me today and uh, sharing about your work and answering those questions. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much for having me. 